This is NBC Nightly News with Jane Pauley. And good evening. A member of the United Nations Commission seeking an end to the crisis in Iran will go back and try again to find a solution to the crisis now on its 196th day. Syrian diplomat Adib Daoudi, a member of the original commission, will return to Iran at the request of UN Secretary General Kurt Waldheim. The commission visited Iran from late February until early March but was not allowed to see the hostages and never completed its report. The new initiative was greeted with caution in Washington. We have two reports. First, Bill Lynch at the White House. After separate meetings in Europe with Iran's Foreign Minister Gopsadeh and Secretary of State Muskie, Secretary General Waldheim is sending an emissary back to Tehran. He is Syria's UN Ambassador Adi Daoudi, a member of the UN Commission that went to Iran last March, but which was blocked from seeing the American hostages. The unexpected announcement came this afternoon from a UN spokesman in New York. During the visit, he will discuss the resumption of the work of the United Nations Commission of Inquiry and the completion of its mandate, including its report, in order to solve the crisis between Iran and the United States. Stadjuhar said Daoudi would go to Tehran after meeting with Waldheim in Europe in the next 10 days. He called the trip an important step. But officials here won't go that far. They're being careful not to raise false expectations and are playing down the Daoudi mission as entirely exploratory at this stage. An administration spokesman said it is hoped Daoudi can learn whether or not Iran will allow the commission to complete its agreed mandate, namely seeing and interviewing all the American hostages. The spokesman cautioned that the United States has no evidence of any change in Iran's position on that score. He also stressed that while Secretary Muskie was informed of the Daoudi mission by Waldheim, the U.S. played no role in initiating the visit. One aide reflected the official caution here when he said, this is not a very big step forward, but let's not stomp all over it. Bill Lynch, NBC News, the White House. Secretary of State Muskie was in Bangor to make what he termed a non-political speech to the state Democratic Convention following the graduation of his daughter from the University of Maine. Afterward, he discussed the latest United Nations initiative with newsmen. He described it as an exploratory move with no guarantee of success. I think it's important not to raise American expectations about any particular initiative because that's been like a roller coaster and I don't think it helps to have American expectations traveling a roller coaster on these things. Uh, that doesn't mean that we should ignore any initiative, that we shouldn't examine it uh, as thoroughly as we can and whenever it shows some promise for another step, take it. It's in that spirit that I, I regard this latest Go Today uh, initiative. Muskie was skeptical about the timing of this latest initiative, noting that it came while Western European nations were meeting in Naples to decide what kind of sanctions to apply against Iran and just before a conference of Islamic countries in Pakistan. He also pointed out that a previous UN mission failed because of the confused political situation in Iran. And he said there's no evidence that situation has changed for the better. Richard Valeriani, NBC News, in Bangor. The American allies, the Europeans, and the Japanese have been under a lot of public pressure from the Carter administration to impose strict economic sanctions against Iran. Today was the day the Europeans had pledged to do that, but now it looks like they are reconsidering. Jim Upshaw is with the Japanese, and Keith Miller is in Naples with the ministers from the European Economic Community. The foreign ministers arrived at this seaside villa for two days of private meetings. During their talks, the ministers will finalize a plan to impose economic sanctions against Iran. Last month, the ministers agreed to cut off all exports, excluding food and medicine, by today, unless there was decisive progress towards the release of the 53 American hostages. But now, sources close to the meeting say the sanctions are likely to be far less severe than originally announced. The ministers are reportedly discussing a sanctions plan that would be applied in stages. The sources said the Europeans are concerned that a total export ban may hamper efforts to gain the release of the hostages. And some countries feel that a total trade ban will hurt the Europeans far more than the Iranians. One of the concessions being discussed is the exclusion of current and highly lucrative contracts from the sanctions plan. President Carter has told the EEC he expects it to impose sanctions against Iran in full force. But it now appears that the U.S. will be disappointed in a sanctions plan that may lack any real economic impact. Keith Miller, NBC News, Naples.
Japan exports machinery and textiles to Iran, but has stopped signing new contracts and is considering halting all sales except food and medicine. The Japanese will go that far only if Europe does. And they will exempt from export controls one pet project to build a $2 billion petrochemical plant in Iran. Already Japan has lost its Iranian oil supply by refusing to pay more for the oil. The United States considers that a helpful gesture in the hostage crisis and will help Japan find oil elsewhere. The collapse of Prime Minister Ohira's government is not expected to weaken Japan's resolve. The Japanese are U.S. allies and will help punish Iran, but unlike Europe, they won't say exactly how until next week. That shrewd bit of foot dragging will force Europe to set the pace and take most of the heat, giving Japan more freedom to concentrate on its domestic problems, like electing a new government. Jim Upshaw, NBC News, Tokyo. South Korea is under full martial law after a week of student violence and what the official announcement called North Korean movements. Interim President Choi is still technically in charge, but the rest of his civilian government has been superseded by the military. Minutes after the announcement, the martial law command closed the schools, banned political activity, and arrested several well-known dissidents, including the head of South Korea's major political party. Know what I just got? A 1980 Chevrolet Caprice Classic. Beautiful. It's roomy, comfortable, downright elegant. Lots of new technology, too, which is why no car this roomy beats Caprice's mileage estimates with its standard engine. Sure, I could have spent more, but why? This Caprice Classic's got it. Now I've got it. This Chevy's got it. Just come and get it. Get a brand new Chevrolet. Oh, am I too early? My watch is fast. <laughs> the others will be here any minute, Jenny. Relax. Sorry, I've had too much caffeine, and my doctor says that it bothers me. Don't you drink Sanka brand decaffeinated coffee? I, I like real coffee. Sanka brand is real coffee. Have some. Mmm, it does taste good. Jenny, am I too early? Nope. We both have time for a cup of Sanka brand. <laughs> <laughs> Sanka brand. Enjoy your coffee and enjoy yourself. The Coast Guard says at least 10 people drowned today when a Cuban refugee boat capsized a few miles north of Cuba. Two Coast Guard cutters rescued 38 people. Four others are missing. The three-and-a-half-week-old exodus from Cuba prompted a huge pro-Castro demonstration in Havana today, the second such since the refugee flow began. Robin Lloyd reports. Hundreds of thousands of Cubans marched past the U.S. interest section in Havana, chanting anti-U.S. slogans. Cuba, yes. Yankees, no. Yankees out of Guantanamo. Inside the interest section, U.S. diplomats watched. For security reasons, they had boarded up the doors and some of the windows. Earlier this week, the State Department called back 17 of the diplomats because of concerns for their safety. Now, only a handful remain, along with the 383 Cubans who took refuge there two weeks ago. Security was also on the minds of Cuban authorities. They set up a line of militia in front of the interest section to make sure that the crowd did not get out of control. In the past month, resentment against the United States has been building up steadily, and it's not likely to stop. In the minds of these people, the United States is the reason why so many people want to leave Cuba. And the fact that Cubans are now taking refuge inside the U.S. interest section only reinforces that belief. Outside Havana, there were more demonstrations against the United States. Cuban officials predicted that five million would turn out. But the focus of today's marches was clearly the U.S. interest section. Cuban officials have given no hint on when those would-be refugees inside will be allowed to leave to go to the United States. Robin Lloyd, NBC News, Havana. A majority of Americans are ready to close the door to any more Cuban refugees. A Newsweek magazine poll found that 59 percent think the Cuban immigration is too difficult and too expensive. Reverend Jesse Jackson led 5,000 people in a march through Washington today to protest cuts in the federal budget. They chanted, we want jobs, from the Washington Monument to the Capitol. And when the crowd reached the White House, everyone knelt to the sidewalk while Reverend Jackson prayed for an end to economic hardship. 
Similar demonstrations are planned for both political conventions this summer in New York and in Detroit, where the auto industry is the very symbol of hard times. Irving R. Levine reports. The automobile assembly line, born in the United States, a symbol of American industrial strength, will, for the first time this year, be overtaken by Japan. The United States will drop to second place in the production of cars. Japan will turn out 11 million cars. The U.S., 8.8 million. 21% of all cars being sold in the United States this year are made in Japan. And that is a major reason for the growing unemployment in the auto industry. One American worker in every four has been laid off. At the same time, the Japanese are working overtime in auto plants to meet the American demand for small, gas-efficient cars. In a desperate search for relief, American auto executives want the Japanese to voluntarily give up overtime work on exports. Ford Chairman Philip Caldwell. There's something uh, fundamentally unfair about having uh, overtime going on in Japan in large quantities when we have more than 250,000 direct employees of the major car mar uh, producers uh, out of work here. And at a White House meeting this week with auto officials, President Carter ruled out import restrictions on Japanese cars for fear of retaliation. Transportation Secretary Neil Goldschmidt. It needs to be understood that we don't just manufacture and sell cars in the United States. We sell airframes and computers and a lot of other things abroad <clears throat> that an action by the United States government, either through its State Department or its special trade representative, uh, is capable of being reciprocated in other areas. And I think we have to be very careful about how we handle our, our trade matters. We with no relief on imports, along with high interest rates on car purchases, U.S. automakers face a grim future. Chrysler Chairman Lee Iacocca. Generally, the economic posture of the auto business today is that the next six months to a year are going to be pure hell. Auto executives say that when American plants get into full production in a year or so on small cars, they will give Japan a run for its money. Until then, the automakers want help from the White House. Easier credit for car purchases, tax breaks, fewer regulations. President Carter has promised to help and the auto industry is waiting to see what that will be. Irving R. Levine, NBC News, the White House. A management consulting firm for Chrysler Corporation predicts that Chrysler will lose $100 million more than expected in 1980 and that total losses could reach $850 million. Chrysler won approval of $1.5 billion in federal loan guarantees last week. Chrysler is not sure how much of that money it will have to use this year. I've got a nice business, but I'm no whiz at financial planning. Fortunately, my Connecticut general representative is. He sure comes through for me. Coming through for you, that's what CG people do. My successful business became more successful after Connecticut general helped me work out a cash flow strategy. CG sure came through for me. Coming through for you, that's what CG people do. Call us, we'll come through for you too. Say goodbye to super strong glue that's a pain to open. No. That's messy to use. Oh, no. That clogs up. Uh, come on. Come on. Say hello to Elma's Wonder Bond Plus. With this new exclusive tip. Twist, it's open. Hey. To put one drop of glue right where you want it. Even on the head of a pen. And this special plug helps keep our tip clog free. Get Wonder Bond Plus in a super new package from Elmer's. And stick with a name you can trust. I'm Johnny Bench, and I know how to prevent runs. This is how I do it at home plate. And this is how I do it at home, with Krylon spray paint. Krylon goes on easy on metal or wood. The special quick-dry formula helps prevent runs and drips. So you get a smooth, professional finish in as little as two hours. Johnny, the table looks great. Yep, no runs, no drips, no air. <laughs> Krylon, for the do-it-yourself professional finish. Love Canal, the Hooker Chemical Company, buried tons of toxic chemicals there 30 and 40 years ago. 
Two years ago, some of the chemicals began seeping up through the ground into a school, a playground. More than 200 homes built there. 239 families were evacuated. 36 men and women from the area volunteered for some tests. And today, the Environmental Protection Agency announced that rare chromosome abnormalities had been found in a third of them. We have two reports tonight. First, Rebecca Sobel in Washington. The Federal Environmental Protection Agency no, said it had made only a preliminary study of Love Canal residents. EPA Deputy Director Barbara Blum explained why the agency made that study public. When we got the results of it, uh, they were so alarming that we felt that we needed to take immediate action in informing these people. Uh, indeed, it's one of the uh, worst chemical problems that we have discovered yet in modern society. The EPA tested 36 Love Canal residents. 11 of them showed damage to their chromosomes. Chromosomes carry the genes that determine physical and behavioral characteristics. Dr. Stephen Gage of the EPA says chromosome damage can lead to such problems or can be associated with such problems as birth defects, as neoplasms, which to the layman are cancers, and such problems also as spontaneous abortions. In Houston today, Donald Bader, president of the Hooker Chemical Company, attacked the EPA for issuing a preliminary report. To draw any conclusions or to take any precipitous action based on these inadequate findings would be unwarranted and a disservice to the residents of Love Canal. EPA officials estimate it will cost more than $25 million to clean up Love Canal. They say they need more federal money to start investigating the approximately 3,000 other chemical dump sites in this country. Uh, Love Canal could have been remedied in the beginning for $3 million. Uh, and if it had have been, none of this would have happened. Rebecca Sobel, NBC News, Washington. For years, the Love Canal Homeowners Association has cited evidence of significant health problems in the neighborhood. Problems such as frequent miscarriages and birth defects, skin diseases, kidney disorders, more suicides than normal. Still, many of those who were told today they might well have chromosome damage were quite shaken, like Phyllis White Knight, who has already battled cancer. On our street alone, there has been already eight cases of cancer on a 15-house street. And it's really had me scared all along, but they tell me it was a national average. And uh, now I have found proof that, that probably I will even get it again. Many Love Canal residents desperately want to move. But so far, the government has only concentrated on evacuating the people in those homes closest to the Hooker chemical dumping site, which had been turned into a school. Those on the surrounding streets say they can only afford to leave with government help. Financial assistance they haven't received yet. And this is the house that Jim and Barbara Quimby want to leave. They have lived here since they were married nine years ago. It's like being a prisoner. You're paying this mortgage every month for what? You know, to live like this? We didn't want to live in a prison. Eight-year-old Brandy Quimby has several birth defects, and she's mentally retarded. So her parents were not at all surprised to hear that each of them might well have chromosome damage. Her condition has, re you know, resulted because of a chemical dump. And I truly believe that that, that is the answer since uh, five years of genetic testing before Love Canal told us nothing. Ahead, further testing. And there are lawsuits. The federal government is suing Hooker Chemical. Many families are. State and federal officials say they might soon have an announcement of some relocation assistance. And that couldn't come soon enough for the Quimby's. I feel drained. I feel so tired. I just want to get my new house. I don't even want to have a telephone. But they've been fighting their battle for years, and many of the Love Canal residents are convinced it will take a long time before they win their fight to get out. Bob Franken, NBC News, Niagara Falls, New York. Excuse me, what did you have for dinner? Underdone chicken and an overdrawn bank account. And then? Indigestion. Indigestion? Pepto-Bismol. And what did you have for dinner? A little of this, a little of that, and a lot of in-laws. And then? Indigestion. Indigestion, Pepto-Bismol. It coats, soothes, relieves. Let's do something romantic. It's their anniversary. I thought we were buying a frying pan. A fancy restaurant. Let's have some flowers. A dark restaurant with candles. Where are we going to find that? Hold it, hold it. Back in Raleigh. Hold it. The first 
step is the Yellow Pages. The Bell System Yellow Pages, the first step to help you plan a celebration. Strolling Before violin. you waste time and energy, take the first step. Let your fingers do the walking through the Bell System Yellow Pages. Dad, we may have to borrow some money. Oh. slacks fit him too close for comfort if he just can't stand to sit then he needs levi's action slacks perhaps the most comfortable slacks a man can wear the waistband and fabric stretch to give you more room when you need it comfortable comfortable i could sit through a double feature now oh. levi's action slacks from levi's sportswear where quality never goes out of style in Tampa, Florida, a Marine Board of Investigation heard from the man who was guiding a ship through Tampa Bay May 9th when the ship hit the bridge, killing 35 people. We have a report from Chris Rebelo of Station WFLA-TV. During his testimony, harbor pilot John Laro said blinding rains hit just as his vessel approached the Sunshine Skyway. He thought he was too close to drop anchor. Laro said he thought he would pass under the bridge at the correct point, but a mistaken sighting of a channel marker sent him off course. He claims an oncoming vessel and heavy winds kept him from turning. Everything happened too fast. It took me a second or two after seeing the bridge to determine that it was not the center of the bridge. You know, the first thing I did was to telegraph while my mouth was moving, come hard port and drop both anchors. And then the vessel hit the bridge. Lero has piloted vessels in and out of Tampa Bay 789 times. He hit the Sunshine Skyway once before in a minor collision. Investigators could recommend the Pilots Association pull his license. Local officials could charge him with criminal negligence. The Marine Board of Inquiry plans on calling other harbor pilots, a weather expert, and a naval architect before its work is completed. Some of the people driving across the Skyway that morning have also asked to testify. Findings of fault and safety recommendations should be forthcoming within six months. Lero made his own safety recommendations, suggesting massive fendering of the bridge and the placement of small islands to block off everything but the main channel. But he said nothing could control the wind's effects on a huge vessel. In Tampa, I'm Chris Rebelo for NBC News. Four white ex-policemen today were found not guilty in the death of a black Miami man late last year. The victim, Arthur McDuffie, died of injuries after trying to outrun Dade County police on his motorcycle. The prosecution had charged that the police beat McDuffie to death and then tried to make it look like a motorcycle accident. The trial was moved from Miami to Tampa because a judge said the case would have been a racial time bomb in Miami. Buena Vista College, you've probably never heard of it, but somebody has. The tiny college in Iowa has received a gift, $18 million. That breaks down to almost $14,000 per student. It's the biggest per student college endowment ever, but it comes with strings. The college must raise $9 million in matching funds and can't reveal the donor's identity. In Washington, veterinarians at the National Zoo today tried to help nature produce some baby pandas. The prospective parents, Ling Ling and Sing Sing, were given to the United States by China eight years ago. The giant pandas have not been able to mate by themselves, so today the female, Ling Ling, was artificially inseminated. If it works, she'd give birth in about five months, and the zoo says pandas usually are produced two at a time. Today was the 105th running of the Preakness in Baltimore, and the Philly didn't make it. Genuine risk, the Philly who won the Kentucky Derby two weeks ago, came in second today. The winner was Codex. The jockey riding genuine risk, though, protested the win, saying Codex bumped his horse coming out of the last turn. But officials dismissed the protest. is a test track and a test of a remarkable machine. It uses a fuel-efficient Honda four-stroke engine and automatic decompression for easy starts. 
It has a unique oil pump that improves lubrication and many other advanced features. The Honda Rotary Mower. Think of it. A lawnmower engineered by Honda. Now you can walk into your favorite paint retailer and walk out with a real value. Glidden Spread House Paint on sale for only $9.99 a gallon. That's right, Glidden's very best house paint. Now only $9.99 a gallon. But hurry, Spread House Paint will last on your house. But at the low price of $9.99, it won't last on the shelf. Glidden, paint you can be loyal to. Look, arthritis minor pain flares up. When I lift, I feel it way down to here, the pain. Here are three pain relievers. Pick one. Double buffered. 50% more pain reliever arthritis pain formula. It works for hours. Try it. Look, I, I feel so good. It was really hurting. I really, really mean it. I couldn't do this. I'm going to buy arthritis pain formula. Oh, it is wonderful. The sequel to Star Wars is here. It's called The Empire Strikes Back, and George Lewis has the story. This wasn't your usual Hollywood premiere. First of all, it was in Washington, not Hollywood, and there were no searchlights, no long lines of Rolls Royces disgorging celebrities left and right. This premiere, a benefit, was for children, retarded children and their families, people who participate in the Special Olympics program. The actors featured in The Empire Strikes Back were also there, posing for pictures and signing autographs. But as any Star Wars addict knows, it's not the actors, it's the special effects that steal the show. And a lot of people have been wondering whether the producers could top the technical razzle-dazzle of the original Star Wars. They have. The movie is filled from beginning to end with elaborate special effects such as this battle between the good guys and the bad guys, armed with huge walking tanks. Go now. All right, coming in. And in the final moments of the movie, a lightsaber duel between number one bad guy, Darth Vader, and number one good guy, Luke Skywalker. The movie is pure escapism, no big social message. But these days, with the way the world is, there is a lot to escape from. So it's a good bet that many Americans this spring will be going to that galaxy long ago and far, far away. George Lewis, NBC News, at the Kennedy Center in Washington. And that's our report tonight. Jessica Savage will be here tomorrow night. I'm Jane Pauley, back Monday morning on Today. Until then, good night. Saturday, BJ gets supercharged by a beautiful moonshiner. Then on Sanford, Ann Esther's son moves in. Watch it, sucker! And puts the moves on Evelyn's daughter. It's not what you're thinking. I know what I'm thinking. Then Joe's world is in an uproar over an unexpected pregnancy. Everybody blames Johnny Carson. Saturday on NBC. Is youth none of your business? They ought to be. This summer, make it your business to give a youth a job. Employers call 828-JOBS. Crazy Glue, strong enough to hold this man suspended in mid-air. Crazy Glue repairs a broken china mug. Just run a little Crazy Glue along the crack and it's fixed in less than 10 seconds. Bonds almost anything. A plastic knob, a plastic plug, a rubber boot, a metal brooch, a fishing rod, a cycle grip, model planes and model trains, a doorknob screw, a flashlight case, the broken trim on any car. Bonds in seconds with amazing strength without clamps, mixing or mess. Get Crazy Glue today.